Labrit, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Stalis Juchna, I'm Vice Director for Research at this university. So with me is Francesco and we will have a few words before we start this, this workshop. First of all, uh, I will tell a little bit why it's happening here in our campus and uh, how this workshop actually come along because uh, our cooperation with ESSA didn't start today. But just uh, to start with, I would like just to welcome you to our campus. So where you are uh, located actually is the, it's, uh, the Tipsala campus, which is the main campus for Riga Technical University. I would like to just uh, also note that this year we're celebrating 160 years anniversary. It's actually there will be a man many events happening here on this campus and what is uh, very notable that we are finishing the all constructions this year. So I hope you can enjoy uh, both city but also the all facilities we have available here on campus. So just to say that Riga Technical Univers University is a is the, the one of the leading technical universities in the region. We have nine faculties and we of course are mostly working with engineering, but also with economics and, and also with IT. So that's why we are very pleased to host this event in our facilities. But uh, I would like to just to mention that this uh, event could not happen without cooperation with our partners. Of course, ESSA in the first place, because as I said, we've been working with ESSA for some time. Uh, but also I would like to acknowledge the uh, contribution from uh, Ministry of Education of Science, which has been steering this uh, space research and education for some time, and also uh, the Institute of uh, Environmental Solutions, which has actually helped us to set up this event. Uh, and I think this, the very fact that this uh, event is happening is um, a sign of uh, how, in general, Latvia is willing to go more into the research related to the space and education related to the space. Just about two years ago, we actually joined ESSA as associated member, and we have put up agenda, you know. We had to have different events related to the research, so there have been uh, many competitions organized uh, by, La uh, by ESSA in, in Latvia, and also uh, just to notice that um, um, we, uh, as a Riga Technical University, also joining together with uh, business organizations, the uh, ESA BIC, which is a European Space Agency business incubator. In CESIS, which is, as I said, one of our partners, they're also building very interesting space education center for kids. And they're also the master program on space engineering coming up. So what, what, I, what is uh, basically uh, showing that uh, Latvia has uh, identified space research education as one of the priorities. Just to keep in mind that these events like this hopefully will have more and more. And then when we had a meeting between uh, a Latvian space uh, agency and also the Minister of Education, we realized that there is something missing still in this, in this pathway. Uh, and this is the programs like that, this kind of more hands-on type of, you know, educational courses, workshops, and that's why we decided to set up this workshop, which is uh, taking place here, for one week. So, and the, the idea is exactly this, not just to have a, like a, you know, technical knowledge, but to have more like hands-on uh, teaching, education, using the knowledge which uh, ESSA offers not just by the academia, but those also the, by the private entities and the municipalities. I see there are some representatives from there. So I'm very happy that we have been showing this uh, uh, opportunity, but there's also a very great interest from you. So uh, when I was actually doing my master thesis, uh, my master thesis in, in KTH in Sweden, uh, it was about using space agency data for finding the best sites for disposing sludge. But this week, as I guess you will learn much more, not just about environmental issues and as not just about climate, but also very practical things, how to deal with the uh, you know, changing climate. So I hope that you enjoy this, uh, this week, that uh, you will learn something which you can use then in your daily life. And from now, I'm just passing the microphone to Francesco, so he will tell a little bit more about the course. Okay, thanks. So I don't know if I need this because I yeah, had yeah, sure. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah? So with the microphone or just my voice? Yeah? Microphone is working? No, it's not, no, no it's, it's not working. working. Oh, no, it's oh now yes. Ah, okay, good. So, so Labrit uh, Visiem, is it correct? <laughs> good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Francesco. Thanks uh, to the Vice Rector for introducing me and for introducing ISA. So it's true that uh, now we have a, um, a long-lasting cooperation uh, with Latvia. Uh, by the way, this is not the first course that we do here. It's the first one maybe in Earth Observation since you are an associate member state. But we had another one um, in Latvia, which was maybe five or six years ago, um, in CESIS. Uh, it was with the Institute for Environmental Solution hosting us, and uh, of course uh, with the ministry, so Kaspar Karolis was uh, coordinating with ISA, and uh, we have very good cooperation uh, uh, with this country. Um, it's a very dynamic country. We are astonished how young people uh, are also in, uh, in high positions. So uh, well, the same is also for Lithuania and Estonia. So we are very... Um, happy to keep working with you and to um, provide this course, but this course is just five days, it's not much, so it should be just a starting point to uh, have uh, increased uh, cooperation and interaction with you. Uh, it's true that uh, we try to give um, uh, a hands-on uh, uh, focus to this course, or in general to the type of courses we do uh, in uh, introducing earth observation, because we know that university, you get a lot of theory. It's the same also in, uh, in Italy, of course. And uh, it's rare to have opportunities to process data and to learn how to extract the information practically from data. Uh, in the end of the course, we always uh, have a feedback form where we try to get feedback to, from you to uh, improve the quality of our courses. And what we learned in the past is that students um, ideally, would like to have 100% hands-on and 0% theory. But of course, that's not possible either because we have to give you some um, uh, background of what we are explaining to you. So we cannot just give you um, exercises without uh, explaining you the background. So we try, we try anyway to have as much as possible balance. Uh, the challenge this time, this week, is that um, not all teachers uh, are coming. In fact, maybe half of them are coming and the other ones are doing remotely. Why? Uh, because uh, some of them have got COVID in the last weeks. Uh, now COVID is no longer so bad as it used to be, but still uh, uh, we have a lot of cases. We had uh, a few weeks ago the Living Plant Symposium of Visa. This is a huge symposium in earth observation, maybe the largest uh, earth observation symbo symposium which exists. It was in Bonn, and there were 6,000 uh, participants, so it was a big success. But just after the symposium, uh, many people who were there got sick again. So uh, it's really a challenge. We want to start doing things in presence uh, again. So we are doing this course here in presence, but uh, we are facing also this, uh, these problems. So I'm sorry that we will have to listen to some uh, presentations. Even today, uh, Pierre-Louis um, was supposed to come, but he will do the, his lecture remotely. But of course, it will be interactive. So you should ask questions. Of course, it's not the same as having the person in front of you, but uh, we'll uh, have to find a way uh, also from today to see if we want to uh, have the questions all the time or maybe every 10 minutes, we have to find out. So, um, t welcome to this course. Um, I'm not um, organizing this course alone because, uh, of course, uh, uh, here there are many people helping me, but also from Misa's side there is Amalia. Who's, uh, Amalia, where are you? Yeah, uh, over there. Um, Amalia is uh, helping me since uh, many years in these uh, um, training courses, and she's also very good in uh, uh, data processing, so uh, especially for SNAP and uh, for other tools that we'll use during this week. Uh, don't ask me, <laughs> please ask her, because I, I'm no longer processing data since uh, many years. Unfortunately, I'm just uh, dealing with um, theory and, uh, um, and bureaucracy. <laughs> so, uh, Riga Technical University is helping us, of course, very much to set up this course, the Ministry of Education as well, and the Institute for Environmental S uh, Solutions in CESIS. I don't know, I hope that um, they are also joining us. Maybe on Friday they are presenting what they are doing, because of course another purpose of this course is to create networking so that you know who in Latvia or in Lithuania and Estonia are processing data for earth observation, and you can join, hopefully, in partnership with them. Um, so the 
program of this course it covers all the week. We, um, we will cover uh, today the basic or remote sensing, especially uh, SAR, because I think that we are um, most knowledgeable with the optical remote sensing, so we try to focus a bit more on SAR, uh, so on radar. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we'll see applications on radar and optical remote sensing for land cover applications. And also, uh, for all the applications that we'll show, we'll try also to, uh, to see the impact of climate change. Um, then tomorrow, uh, we will uh, move from uh, land cover to uh, forestry and uh, forestry applications. Um, and uh, the course will be done. So today is a Pierre Louis Frison from University of Paris. Tomorrow we have VTT Finland. And Oleg will talk about um, SAR and optical joint uh, application for optical, uh, sorry, for forestry applications. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, we have Pierre de Fourny from University of Leuven, Belgium, and he's, he's a specialist, uh, he's our main expert for the uh, application of uh, optical and radar remote sensing to agriculture, so agricultural man uh, monitoring and uh, agricultural management as well. And uh, uh, we will also have uh, exercises in the afternoon with SNAP uh, for these applications. On uh, Thursday, uh, we have the pleasure of having here Ramon Hansen from the University of Delft. And Ramon is one of the main uh, specialists in Europe for uh, ground motion using radar. Uh, so he started with a classical application of interferometry. Uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, or maybe even longer, we, after we launched the ERS-1. And then, uh, of course, this technique, as you might know, has evolved, and uh, now we are able to process long series of uh, uh, radar data uh, interferometrically in order to derive very precise ground motion um, information and separating uh, this information from other uh, artifacts. Finally, on the last day, we have in the morning marine application or remote sensing, especially uh, radar remote sensing. And in the afternoon, we'll have presentations from uh, Latvian experts showing different projects based on all the techniques that you have seen during the week. Okay. So uh, then I move to um, the real presentation. I think that most of you are, know already what is ESA, so the European Space Agency. And uh, uh, we have now 22 member states. Um, we use space information uh, only for peaceful purposes. Um, and uh, we have a different establishment all over Europe. We have our headquarters in Paris and then um, establishments in Italy, uh, Germany, Spain, Holland, and many other countries. And our uh, budget, so this is the one of last year, is around uh, 7 billion euros per year. So we are a world leader in science and technology, and uh, we are uh, working uh, in every area of the space sector. We developed uh, 80 satellites, and uh, uh, we operate uh, most, many satellites since 1975. So now it's a really a long time. We started with the meteorological satellites and then we evolved to other types of uh, uh, Earth observation satellites. So um, on top of the 22 member states, we have uh, three associate members, uh, which are Slovenia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and other cooperation agreements, uh, for example, with Canada. And uh, so our member states are not exactly the same of the uh, uh, European Union. Uh, most of them are, but is, uh, there is not a 100% overlap. And for this reason, uh, it's uh, sometimes challenging uh, to, um, to have pro um, these cooperations because uh, we uh, don't have exactly the same member states. And uh, uh, also, you may have heard that European Union has created now a known uh, space agency it's called USPA. Um, also in charge of uh, mainly Copernicus and Earth Observation. They are based in Prague. And the reason is that we don't have exactly the same member states. So, of course, we not du duplicate the effort and the projects, but uh, um, not all the projects can be done with ESA or with USPA. Uh, so, depending on uh, who is contributing, uh, one agency is uh, um, working or the other on the project. The location of this establishment, 
um, and I'm just uh, like to point out where we are based uh, in uh, my establishment in Esrin, it's in Frascati near Rome, and there we are mainly working on earth observation exploitation. So not the design of the satellites, but rather the exploitation of the data or the earth observation satellites which are uh, being operated. So, um, on top of Earth observation in Esrin, we are also uh, working uh, uh, on uh, the development of the Vega launcher. It's the European small launcher. Uh, we are also operating from there the International Char Charter for Space and Major Disaster, which is a mechanism to um, operate the different uh, Earth observation satellite from uh, different uh, agencies, not only ESA, uh, to uh, have a, a quick um, um, response in case of major disasters and provide uh, information and maps of uh, the um, disasters to the civil protection of the countries which have been affected. And this is not only for Europe, it's for every country in the world. So we have 24-hour uh, call service uh, to um, respond emergencies in using air observation. So these are just examples. Uh, um, most uh, uh, disasters which are occurring and that can be uh, monitored using earth observation are floods, uh, then uh, uh, forest fires, earthquakes, and many others. This is uh, uh, an interesting uh, example of application of earth observation. By the way, all the data, all the maps are, are um, made available on, on the web. And uh, it's uh, also an interesting case study to create exercises and be prepared for uh, um, this type of uh, applications. So um, the main goal, if we should resume in a few words, of uh, the ESA Earth Observation Program is to take the pulse of our planet to understand uh, the uh, main parameters which are um, ruling the different systems and subsystems, and uh, then uh, provide this data in a timely manner to uh, scientists that can then develop models to better understand our environment and possibly predict what's going to happen. The uh, fleet of uh, Earth observation satellites is now very, very huge, um, and we can divide them mainly in three uh, families. So the meteorological family, um, something that started in 1975, as I mentioned, and uh, which is operated uh, by Umetsat. Uh, so ESA is launching the satellites, and then is passing over the um, uh, processing of the data and the operation of the satellite to Umetsat. Uh, then we have the Earth Observation uh, Fleet for um, Operation Applications, which is called Copernicus. This is developed together with the European Commission. Uh, actually, they are providing the funding, and uh, uh, we are operating the data, but uh, they are using the data to develop services. Um, and uh, uh, now, oh, okay, that's where we're standing now. So uh, we, are, we launched already um, um, many Sentinel uh, satellites, uh, but we are preparing already the next generation of uh, Sentinels and uh, the expansion. Uh, we, you may have heard that uh, the, um, we have two uh, radar uh, Sentinels called Sentinel 1A and B. Unfortunately, Sentinel 1B is not working since some months, so we are trying to anticipate the launch of Sentinel 1C in order to give again uh, two radar satellites at the same time in order to have a, a shorter visit and uh, better um, coverage. For the uh, science. For science applications, uh, we uh, develop uh, the family of the Earth explorers, and uh, uh, it's true that these are scientific missions, but still some of the data, uh, unexpectedly, uh, are being used also for operations mm -hmm. in synergy and in combination with the Copernicus satellite. So it's not only for pure science, sometimes the data can be used also for operation. Of course, the difference is that in the case of the Copernicus mission, you have uh, the guarantee of continuity, uh, because uh, there is a, a number of satellites of the same type which has been uh, uh, launched uh, one after the other. And in the case of the um, Earth um, explorers, it's not the case. So one, uh, once a satellite has been launched, we prepare for the next one, but it will be a different type of satellite. 
All together, all the satellite with so many different instruments and parameters which can be measured uh, really uh, give uh, um, a global view of the air system and uh, improve uh, a lot the type of modeling which has been done and is being done by uh, air scientists. So, uh, talking about the Earth Explorers, this is a scientific family. We have uh, some missions which are already flying. Uh, we started with GOCHE, um, a satellite uh, in very low Earth orbit to measure with um, a, a precision that was never achieved before the gravity field of the Earth. We then launched SMOS, a satellite which has a double uh, mission uh, to measure at the same time the salinity and the um, soil moisture. Uh, then we launched Cryosat, um, a satellite able to measure the ice thickness that combined with the radar data uh, of SAR uh, missions, which give the uh, ice extent, is able to help us understand the ice mass of the Earth much better. Then we launched a Swarm, um, which is a, um, a constellation, constellation satellite to measure the uh, Earth magnetic field. And finally, Eolus, um, a mission to uh, measure the wind profiles. Future missions um, are Earthcare and Biomass, going to be launched uh, next year, hopefully. And maybe Biomass uh, uh, will be uh, quite relevant also for your studies, because I know that many of you are working in forestry, and therefore having a, a precise measurement of the biomass uh, all over the planet and in different regions is uh, something which uh, is appealing to many people in this room. And we are preparing also the new candidates. So the number of data which is distributed per day uh, by Copernicus is huge. We are talking about uh, um, an average of 250 terabytes. And 10% uh, of this, 25 terabytes per day, is uh, new data, so data acquired uh, daily. We um, have launched, as I say, a number of Sentinels already. So we have two Sentinel-1, Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B, although Sentinel-1B is presently not working. Uh, Sentinel-2 is the optical um, mission. We have launched two satellites as well, Sentinel-2A and B. The same is for Sentinel-3. Uh, we'll see later what it is, a satellite uh, providing um, different type of measurements. So uh, differently from Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, which are species, uh, um, missions which just provide one type of measurement, Sentinel-3 is a, a more heterogeneous type of measurements. And then we launched Sentinel-5P, um, a satellite uh, uh, which is, was a precursor to Sentinel-6 for um, atmospheric measurements. All these data are available uh, freely and openly. Uh, you don't have to uh, um, submit a project to get the data, as it was before with the ESA data, uh, but you have just to register and uh, download the data uh, um, from, the, um, from the hubs. We are preparing also the next generation of uh, um, Copernicus missions, the so-called Sentinel expansion missions, uh, like the CO2M, uh, which would be um, a mission to measure the anthropogenic CO2 emissions, so and better understand the causes of climate change, uh, or at least the anthropogenic causes. Then uh, CRYSTAL will uh, study the effect of climate change because it will be um, a precise measurement mission for polar ice and snow topography. Uh, finally, uh, we'll uh, also launch SIMR, um, a passive microwave radiometer to measure the sea surface temperature and ice concentration with a uh, very high accuracy. Uh, we are preparing for the LST, the land surface temperature mission, to improve the agriculture and urban management, which is any way that we started already uh, with Sentinel-2 and, and then improved using Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 together, as we will see on Wednesday. We will uh, launch CHIME, hyperspectral um, imager, uh, to improve the um, uh, monitoring of um, minerals, biodiversity, um, and soil, and food security. And finally, ROS-L will be an uh, L-band uh, SAR mission of Europe. Presently, uh, European radar, uh, so uh, first ERS, then uh, um, MVSAT, and now uh, Sentinel-1, are C-band missions. Uh, and we have to rely on uh, uh, external missions to uh, have L-band data. 
Uh, for example, we just signed an agreement with CONAE uh, to get access uh, to uh, European citizens uh, for L-band data uh, by the mission uh, SAOCOM. But uh, we aim at having our own uh, L-band mission in SAR, and this will be um, ROS-L. Those of you who probably man already um, processed L-band data so far used ELOS data, I guess. We had uh, an agreement with the Japanese for ELOS-1. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the case for ELOS-2. Uh, and uh, um, L-band data are very useful for many applications, for example, for agriculture, but also for interferometry, uh, because you can get uh, um, very coherent measurements, um, so with the lower um, phase noise um, over vegetated areas. So all this data together, um, of course, has, uh, have uh, allowed a very um, large number of publications and uh, advances in research. And uh, we had a huge uh, number of presentations in, the, in May uh, at the Living Plants Symposium uh, um, conference in Bonn. It's something that we run every three years, and this is the largest uh, uh, ever um, conference in earth observation. I don't know if any of you has been there. Uh, other, otherwise, uh, I invite you to have a look uh, to the presentations, which are available on the web. And uh, there are also some nice videos. I put there a link. So if we now look at some uh, uh, major results um, achieved recently. Uh, so uh, for example, in terms of climate and climate change, um, the sentinels uh, are data, of course, which are added up to all um, um, many other informations and uh, acquisitions that we acquired uh, since the 90s. So we almost have now um, 30 years of acquisitions of satellite data, uh, at least from ESA side, which can be used to improve our understanding of climate change. And uh, um, I would just mention uh, ERS-1, ERS-2, so the two radar missions, Envisat um, and Cryosat, uh, which of course is very relevant because it uh, helps to understand the ice um, mass of the Earth and the ice balance, and uh, then Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. So um, the contribution, for example, to uh, sea level rise uh, can be divided uh, in the contribution coming from uh, Antarctica and Greenland um, melting. And uh, um, summing up these two contributions, uh, we already arrive to a um, uh, about 30 millimeters per decade increase of the sea level rise. Of course, this is just one of the contributions. There are many others. But uh, um, of course, uh, separating the contribution and the different causes of the sea level rise is very important for scientists to better model the sea level rise and understand also the uh, possible forecast. You may know that uh, um, until a few years ago, the trend in sea level rise was about 3 mm per year increase in average, and now, unfortunately, there is an acceleration, so it seems that we are uh, going towards uh, 4.5 or 4.8 millimeters per year. This is just uh, um, uh, in, av in average. Of course, there are areas where it's slower and areas where it's much larger. We um, also got, uh, uh, this was a very recent result, a reconstruction of the um, Antarctica in 4D using different satellites. So there are, um, this is an animation showing the elevation change um, in, from 2010, more or less, to nowadays but uh, we can go into the details. You will have the presentation and you have a lot of animations and videos showing uh, um, recent results, which are very um, appealing. Um, also, the glacier, glacier eye loss can be uh, measured using uh, Cryosat and uh, Sentinel-1 uh, joint, jointly. And uh, the, um, you can uh, measure Accurately, the, of course, the, there is the, a trend which you can see, uh, which is a, a negative trend. So the, um, this corresponds to a global ice loss in, um, in Alaska. And uh, um, you can also see, of course, a cyclic effect uh, due to the seasonal variation. 
uh, although there are little um, areas you can see in blue, bluish, where uh, we can measure an increase, overall the trend is more, you see the uh, yellow, red colors correspond to a decrease of the global ice mass. Uh, also in Asia, um, on the Himalaya, uh, we measure, we measure um, regularly the um, ice balance, and uh, a few areas show an increase, but uh, overall there is a, a large decrease in the ice balance uh, measured between 2010 and 2019 using our satellites. So we try to um, have an Earth system approach where we um, use uh, all the information uh, provided by satellite, integrated also in situ data, to better understand the water cycle. So uh, the interaction of evapotranspiration, transport, precipitation, runoff, and so on, and to um, uh, provide these different contributions to scientists to improve the overall models. We have a program for um, Earth Science uh, Science, um, which is uh, in particularly uh, developed in the division where I and Amalia work. And uh, uh, many different uh, results have been achieved in the last years, which uh, first were scientific uh, um, research results and then have been uh, converted into operations. One of them is the agricultural monitoring. So we started with the, um, the Sentinel-2 for Agri project that was uh, that still using Sentinel-2 data to improve the agricultural management. And then we integrated data from um, radar, from Sentinel-1. And uh, these two data combined, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, um, allow to better understand the uh, crop uh, mapping, but also uh, other uh, indices which are not just for mapping, but also uh, can help the farmers for the management, like uh, improve the um, irrigation management uh, or the, um, um, the harvest monitoring and so on. So this is also important for the governments, for the insurances, and for the um, European policies. That's why uh, now this algorithm uh, has been adopted by many uh, member states of the um, European Union. We also developed recently, um, in uh, 2020, a worldwide land cover map at 10 meter resolution using Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. Um, so there are 11 classes with an overall accuracy of about 74%, which is very good. And uh, this is uh, available for free uh, from the ESA website. Uh, another interesting um, monitoring, which is now um, becoming more and more operational, is uh, about coastal erosion estimation. And uh, um, I don't know if this has been uh, tested already also in, uh, in the Baltic countries. And I don't know whether this is a major issue here, but in many parts of the world it is. Uh, we also start developing digital platforms because now the problem uh, is that uh, we have so many data accumulated from the, from the archive of the Earth observation satellites uh, plus the new acquisitions, that is becoming a challenge uh, for users to download the data and process the data, if you, especially if you want to do a, moni a regular monitoring of a, a large area. And uh, um, so we try to make dig these digital platforms available to citizens for uh, uh, cloud processing. Uh, we also developed during the uh, COVID years this uh, RACE dashboard. It's a rapid action on coronavirus and earth observation, where there are many uh, tutorials available to uh, look at different parameters which uh, have been impacted uh, somehow uh, by the COVID uh, um, pandemics. And uh, for example, you can have a look at the um, tutorials about uh, um, air pollution and the impact of uh, the pandemics, uh, traffic maps uh, during the pandemics, and so on. It's quite interesting because you can uh, uh, see in uh, different regions of the world the impact uh, of the um, pandemics that we all experienced personally. Uh, we also developed the Euro Data Cube. I don't know if some of you are already uh, using the Euro Data Cube. And uh, um, 
uh, we, um, for this, we got the strong support uh, from the company uh, Synergize, uh, that is also the developer of the EO browser. Uh, by the way, the EO browser can be used also for training and education. We have developed an educational mode, and uh, uh, it's quite nice because it allows you to uh, combine instantly different uh, bands or satellite data, and also nowadays not only visualize the bands and combine different bands, but also to um, um, uh, create your own uh, um, combinations and uh, uh, algorithms for, um, for data processing. We also started recently to develop the digital twin Earth, um, we have already some demonstrators. Uh, the digital twin Earth I is a sort of um, um, model of the Earth, or at least si different systems of the Earth, uh, in order to be able to better understand and model different type of uh, uh, environments. We have one digital uh, twin Earth for the Antarctica with a very precise 4D reconstitution, so also in time, of the Antarctic system. Uh, also including the um, um, atmosphere and ocean interactions and uh, uh, with focus on ice shelves dynamics. Another one is on the Mediterranean and uh, uh, with the hydrological cycle at one kilometer resolution and one hour uh, time resolution. The Climate Change Initiative is something that we started already uh, many years ago, and uh, um, the purpose is to develop a robust and long-term satellite data set uh, for the 21 essential climate variables uh, defined by the Global Climate Observing System. This is a program which is um, carried uh, uh, on by our colleagues in Howell, uh, United Kingdom of ESA, and uh, um, you have many results available already, which can be used also for other applications, because many of these essential climate variables are also important for uh, uh, agriculture, vegetation, uh, forestry, um, and of course you see the impact of the climate change on these variables. Okay, this we have seen already. Uh, yeah, the sea level rise uh, is an important um, parameter, and uh, of course it's, uh, it shows the interaction between the oceans, atmosphere, and the, um, and the um, glaciers worldwide. And uh, we uh, have seen, yes, that it is moving towards 4.5 millimeter per year. Uh, we have also several projects uh, related to the Baltic area. Uh, one of them is Baltic Seal, which is a project aiming to exploit the high-frequency multi-mission altimetry observations. And uh, um, so if you are available, I can provide you more information during this week or links to specialists working on this. Uh, we uh, recently created uh, um, um, a ground motion map uh, at continental um, scale uh, of Europe. We started uh, many years ago uh, measuring uh, regionally or locally the ground deformation over um, uh, sensitive areas, but now we, we moved to a service which is uh, monitoring uh, operationally and uh, continuously the ground motion at uh, uh, European level. This uh, was a big um, challenge, of course, to do that, and uh, it's uh, now um, available since uh, a few months. Uh, it's called Copernicus Land Monitoring Service um, for the European Ground Motion, and uh, um, this was presented intensively in um, May at the Living Plants Symposium, so it's uh, uh, really impressive. I think that uh, maybe this is not a major issue in Latvia, but still, uh, of course, you are not a seismic country and you don't have volcanoes, but uh, uh, there are some areas which are subject to subsidence, and uh, uh, therefore we were asked also to introduce this technique uh, on uh, Thursday when Ramon Hansen is going to teach you the principle of this uh, um, processing. Is there anybody here working on uh, ground motion or uh, radar uh, for interferometry? So one, only one. 
Finally, we um, have also a program for training in earth observation, so that's why we are doing this course here, but we have many more tools that we developed over the last uh, 20 years, and uh, um, we have a centralized web page for education and training where we put all the information of the courses. Uh, we try to publish all the material of the courses that we have done so, the, so that they are available also to students who cannot attend the course. Or for you, after the course, you can uh, uh, still uh, um, uh, access all the information and uh, hopefully redo the exercises and uh, keep um, familiar with the tools that we are, are we, we are developing and maintaining. So the main uh, processing tools for the Sentinel data are um, the SNAP um, packages. Uh, we will see uh, during this course also the application of SNAP to Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data um, processing, but there are many others, for example, for altimetry uh, or for other type of uh, data exploitation. And we, um, on top of the courses that we uh, do in person, like this one, we also develop massive online open courses. We have many MOOCs, uh, which are um, currently accessible from the ESA website or from the website of our partners. In particular, we have one about radar. It's called Ecos in Space. It's about um, Sentinel-1 and also uh, other type of uh, radar um, applications. It's done by the University of Jena. They are very good in radar, and especially in radar application to forestry. So those of you working in forestry probably know Christian Schmulius. Um, we also are doing with them another MOOC about land applications in general. So it's a combination of uh, optical and radar data. Um, so there is a land MOOC. And uh, I invite you after this course, if you haven't done it yet, to uh, register for those MOOCs. It's, it's about 20 hours and you can do it whenever you like. So you can do it, uh, uh, you know the principle of the MOOC. Um, and in the end, you also uh, get a certificate, which is not the most important, of course, but still can be used for uh, academic purposes. Yeah, and um, there is a long series of courses, uh, so like this one, um, for example, uh, in September, we'll uh, hold another course uh, on land applications with the University of Prague, and will be a joint ESA-NASA course. So it will be different from this one, and you're also welcome to apply in case you would like to register. Good, so this is the end of my presentation.